Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining class this morning. Just give me a minute, please. Yeah. So, um, last Wednesday, we were looking at uh, uh, Titus chapter 1. Okay, we reached up to um, verse 15. So can you all please turn in your Bibles to Titus, the book of Titus, chapter 1. And what's to see uh, Paul talking about in the last few verses in uh, Titus chapter 1? Anyone has an idea who he was talking about? Who was Paul talking about in Titus chapter 1, the last few verses? Uh, verses 10 to verse 16. No one wants to answer? Who's Paul talking about in Titus chapter 1, verses 10 to 16? You can look at your Bibles as well. You can type your answer in the chat section. talking about bishops we're talking about uh, we are in titus titus chapter one the book of titus chapter one who is paul talking about in verses 10 to 16 he's talking about the false teachers hello class if all of you there following uh, yes, who are the people who talk in vain? They are the false teachers. So he's basically talking about, uh, uh, you know, the characteristics of the false teachers and helping Titus to identify uh, who are these false teachers. So sometimes we think, you know, why are we studying these books? Uh, it was written, uh, you know, so long time ago. It was basically referring to uh, a, a particular cultural context, uh, a particular situation to particular churches. We don't need it. But if you look at these um, letters, they're quite relevant for us today because, you know, uh, do we face, uh, do we have false teachers in our times today? Yes, no? Yes, we do. Uh, we do have false teachers. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Prince. And uh, <clears throat> uh, so we need to know, uh, you know, what are their characteristics and like, uh, you know, um, uh, you have mentioned in the chat, you know, they are uh, people who are liars, uh, you know, people who talk in vain, who twist the truth. And so Paul is uh, telling Titus to be aware of these false teachers because these are not somebody who come from outside who can really, we can identify, but they are within the church. Uh, those Judaistic believers, that means Jews who have become Christians, uh, who are uh, teaching these false uh, teachers, teachings and doctrines. Okay, so we read verse 15, uh, we look at uh, verse 15 and verse 16 and we'll, with which we will end this chapter. So can one of you please read verse 15, please? Can one of you please read verse 15? Unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their minds and conscience is defiled. Thank you. So here it says, uh, you know, uh, all things. Okay. So here it's basically talking about food. Uh, that uh, God created for consumption. So these false teachers 
uh, basically Jews, they're saying you should eat cut certain kind of meat, certain kind of food in a certain kind of way. So they're bringing in a lot of legalistic rituals and laws and saying, uh, so you don't just receive salvation by faith, but also by keeping all of these Old Testament rituals, rituals and laws and also by um, circumcision, okay? Um, so these false teachers were teaching that Jewish food laws uh, still applied to Christian believers. And uh, Paul is saying that all food is clean, as it says in Mark chapter 7, verse 15. Uh, it says in Mark chapter 7, verse 15, that nothing that enters a man from the outside can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. Okay? Uh, so... Paul is saying to those who are eternally pure, all things are pure. Um, and that means, it does not mean that, uh, you know, uh, uh, including sin, sin is never pure. So, you know, if internally we are pure in our thoughts, in our motives, uh, you know, living a holy life, pursuing a holy and righteous life, then we will see all things as pure. The word defiled here uh, it's, it's a, means a person who in the Greek, the, the Greek meaning of this word defiled here means a person who either rejects the truth of salvation by grace uh, uh, or somebody who forces someone else uh, to receive salvation by any other means. So here the word defiled means a person who rejects, his, rejects the truth of salvation by grace uh, like an unbeliever who says, you know, after hearing uh, the salvation message preached to them, the gospel of truth preached, uh, preached to them, they reject it. Or it can also be those who reject the salvation by grace or, uh, you know, because of what other people are teaching them or these false teachers are teaching them. They're saying that you need to add to the work of salvation or you have to maintain uh, uh, or you have to add to the work of sanctification or you need to maintain your salvation uh, by, you know, um, uh, keeping all the rituals and laws. And so he's saying that such kind of person, people who teach these things, uh, they are defiled in their minds. That means their minds are polluted. Um, and hence, not only their minds are imputed, uh, uh, polluted, sorry, but their conscience is also affected. Uh, and it's their, their uh, faith and their actions also are influenced. And hence, their actions and their faith is also defiled as well. Okay, so when we think that, uh, you know, we can receive salvation or we can work out our salvation every day with fear and trembling by keeping rituals and laws, or when we think that uh, sanctification can be brought about or we can be made holy or, uh, you know, the sins that we have done once we have become believers uh, can be covered up or can be a uh, can be forgiven when we do some good things, you know, and many people think like this, you know, when they, they think that one of the good things is going to church and taking communion is one good thing, or the other thing is feeding the poor or uh, giving to the orphans or giving clothes or money to orphanages or helping those who are in, um, in need. Uh, uh, and people think when they do this, uh, their sins will be forgiven, you know, uh, they will receive the blessings of God. And, uh, you know, this is a wrong kind of thinking, because we cannot, um, uh, you know, receive salvation or maintain our salvation, uh, or we cannot be sanctified by good works. It's only uh, uh, you know, by the work of Christ that he has already completed, which he has finished on the cross. On the cross, Christ paid for our sins. He paid the full price for our sins. And no, nothing else is needed for us uh, to for salvation, to maintain our salvation or for our sanctification. But it's only our obedience to God obedience to his word, obedience uh, 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 in walking according to his will and fulfilling his plan and purpose. And also it is, um, you know, by consecrating our lives, by recommitting and resubmitting and dedicating our lives to God. Okay. 
Um, so here in Titus chapter 1 verse 15, uh, uh, Paul is demonstrating to us that true purity lies not in just observ uh, in observ uh, observing external rules, but in the inner purity of the heart. Okay, so uh, we can also think sometimes, you know, we are serving God, uh, we're doing so much for God, uh, but God is not interested in how much we do. He's more interested in our, you know, how intimate we are in our relationship uh, with Him, how much time we're spending just reading His Word, praying, uh, communing with Christ, fellowshipping with the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's how much we are doing His will. We can do ministry, but we can be doing what we want or what we desire, or what we like. We can also be doing things that uh, will uh, give us a good name or favor or, you know, uh, give us a, 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 a place of good position or money. But it will not be a place that God wants us to be in or where he wants us to uh, serve. So it is all about, you know, obeying God. The pure heart is about obeying God, uh, living a life that is totally committed and surrendered uh, to Him. Okay, a life that has been cleansed and regenerated uh, through our personal trust in the person work of Christ that has been finished and completed uh, for us for our uh, salvation. Okay, so that is what uh, Paul is uh, uh, stating here in verse. 15 so it's not about uh, keeping rituals not about food it's not about the way we dress about what we wear but it's about the inner purity of our hearts the motives the attitudes of our heart uh, that god is more concerned with and our relationship with him verse 16 can one of you please read verse 16 please they claim that they know god but their action deny it they are hateful and disobedient, not fit to do anything good. Thank you. So in verse 16, Paul is stating a fact here, uh, which he's trying to sum up this whole uh, matter that he's been discussing about in verses 10 to right up to verse 16. Uh, and it's the matter related to false teachers. He says, uh, these false teachers are not necessarily unbelievers. Uh, but here it says they profess to know God. It uh, simply means that, uh, you know, these uh, false teachers, they simply profess to know him as savior. Uh, but, you know, um, it could also be the profession to know him in a deeper and a more intimate way by observing rules and regulations which they are seeking to impose on others. So it's a kind of a falsehood, a false truth that they are portraying to people that they know God, they know him as a savior, but also they're saying but if you observe all of these rules and uh, regulations that are in the Old Testament, it's a way that you know him in a more deeper and in an intimate way. Uh, and they're trying to impose this on others so that others will also come into this uh, uh, wrong kind of teaching and will follow it. And he says, you know, these are some people who, uh, you know, who profess to know God, but in works, they deny him. Deny him means they reject or they do not accept him. It means that they fall back on their previous relationship with him. They fall back into unfaithfulness again. It also means that, you know, they abandon their fellowship with the Lord. In other words, these false teachers uh, who are saved uh, have actually slipped back into uh, false uh, legalisms or works uh, and they have fallen away from the grace of uh, 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 from the grace of God or the grace way of living life or the previous grace relationship they had with Jesus when they accepted Jesus Christ so it's no longer by grace that they are living their lives or they have accepted uh, Jesus Christ as their person savior but it is by rules and um, by keeping rituals and keeping certain rules and um, regulations, okay? And Paul then goes on to use some very strong words here, being uh, abnormal, uh, disobedient, and um, disqualified for every good work, okay? Um, so this word abnormal in Greek means somebody who is detestable, 
or it is uh, it carries an idea of being disgusting so it basically means here that those who turn away from the grace that has been given to us freely in Christ Jesus by what he's accomplished on the cross and they move away from this grace into keeping just rituals and laws uh, uh, or move away from grace into legalism and teach others to do this. Uh, Paul is saying that they are detestable in God's sight. Now, is this a problem only in the early church or is this a problem even in our churches today? What is your thoughts on this? About legalism, rituals, laws. Do you think it's uh, some a problem that happened only in the early church during Paul's time, or is it a problem even today? Come on, all of us are part of a church. Uh, we we see things, so we can. Dave says, yes, we still have it. Uh, it's even there today, Aaron, Siddharth. So how is it? How is it there present even today? Can you mention some few instances where you see legalism still there in the church where people are not receiving things by grace but by being legalistic? No thoughts? Nothing have you seen in your churches or in other churches? It would be nice if you can share some of your inputs of what you have seen, how people keep rituals and laws and, uh, you know, make people follow it where they can just receive it freely by grace. Okay, let's not uh, let's talk about our own churches. You know the Protestant churches. In our own churches, whether we are coming from uh, traditional churches or even independent Pentecostal churches, how is legalism brought into the church, or still prevailing in our church today? What about Holy Communion? Is Holy Communion served to everybody who have accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior? No. So what are the criteria the churches put? Come on, this is a good uh, discussion that we can have. Only those who are baptized, yes, thank you. Dave, yes, only so some churches, uh, you know, they say only if you're baptized, uh, you know, uh, uh, you can take Holy Communion. So they don't give Holy Communion to, uh, they give them only to certain uh, ages, not even to children uh, who have accepted Jesus Christ, their personal Savior, whose parents feel that they can take Holy Communion. Uh, so only if it's not Holy Communion is not given to people who uh, have accepted Jesus Christ, but they should have been baptized and only then they can receive Holy Communion. Yes. Anything else? You know, even if people desire to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, um, they, you know, uh, they say you're just born again. Uh, you're not even baptized in water, so you cannot be baptized in the Holy Spirit. You cannot speak in tongues. I know of uh, uh, of uh, one of our house helps uh, who is a living maid, and she's from one of the villages in North India, and um, she came from a non-Christian background, and, uh, you know, um, she accepted Christ, she and her family, and um, she uh, was very desirous of being filled with the Holy Spirit, being baptized in the Holy Spirit, and speaking in tongues. So when when she asked uh, the, the pastor and the, the, the elders of the church, they said, 
uh, you know, you have to wait because people who have been uh, accepted Christ Jesus uh, as a person saviors three months now, you know, uh, they have not they have not been uh, uh, baptized into the Holy Spirit. Uh, so you have not even been baptized in water. Uh, how can you be uh, receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And they said no. So. You know, they've just put all of these conditions. But because she so desired uh, it and she just kept praying about it, one night when she was praying, you know, she started speaking in tongues. And um, uh, the, uh, uh, even if her mother was asking her or siblings were asking her any question, she opened her mouth to speak. She would only just speak in tongues. Um, and the next morning, the same thing continued. So her mother got really scared. She, they thought that she was uh, possessed by uh, an evil spirit and she ran to the pastor and the pastor said, no, you know, um, she's uh, baptized in the Holy Spirit. And all of them were shocked because how can you be baptized in the Holy Spirit? It's not even three months since you have, you know, accepted Christ. You've not been water baptized. So we have all of these uh, rituals that... Um, you know, people um, or, uh, you know, church elders or pastors put on people. They don't uh, baptize them in water. They don't, the Holy Spirit baptism, uh, even don't give them the Holy Communion. Holy Communion is, you know, you just accept Christ as your person, Savior. Let people just enjoy the benefits of uh, what Christ has done on the cross. So these are just few things. There's so many other uh, areas where, uh, you know, they People bring in legalism uh, when the grace of God is just freely available for people to receive and enjoy everything that Christ has purchased for us on the cross. So when Christ has not put any limitations, uh, we as as uh, as pastors, you know, future pastors of uh, uh, churches should not put any uh, limitations or uh, hurdles on people. Anyone else wants to share anything happening in your churches? about how legalism is taking precedence over the grace of God. Okay, let's continue. Then he says about, uh, you know, that uh, these false teachers are disobedient. Disobedient means is a result of a lack of trust. Um, uh, they have a failure to trust or rest in the person and work of Christ uh, as a savior um, or just trust in what Christ has completed on the cross, his death, his resurrection, uh, that he has, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, what he has done on the cross and what they can uh, receive. So they fail to trust or rest in the person and work of Christ as savior, as an unbeliever, or to rest in the sufficiency of the death and resurrected life as a Christ, as a Christian leads uh, to disobedience to the will of God. Okay, and uh, he says that such people are also disqualified. That means um, they uh, are. Uh, it means that they are rejected. They do not stand the test. Uh, they are unqualified, worthless, and unfit to even teach or preach, or uh, you know, to hold a position in church okay and then paul ends uh this whole verse in verse 16 he says they're disqualified for every good work so uh one of our purposes in life is uh, you know to be useful in the service of christ uh by ministering to others so when we have received salvation uh, you know, we've received it not as just as a privilege, but it's a responsibility to share this uh, with others as well, to be useful in God's kingdom by uh, sharing this with others and bringing others into God's kingdom. So it's only through faith in Christ and through uh, what he has done on the cross that uh, we can uh, be saved, that we can um, uh, receive uh, our sanctification, and uh, we can also become fit for every good work that we can do to say uh, to minister in His kingdom. Okay, so with that, he ends uh, uh, chapter one. Any questions? Any doubts? Any thoughts on chapter one? Okay, if not, we will move on to chapter two. Okay, um, 
We'll read chapter 2. So please turn in your Bibles to Titus, uh, chapter 2. And like all of us to read a few verses. Titus chapter 2, there's uh, 15 verses, so I think, uh, can all of you read or uh, do you have, some of you have uh, issues reading? Who are the people who, who, uh, who are willing to read uh, Titus chapter 2, a couple of verses? Just give me a minute, please. So who would like to read? Okay, they will read. Anyone else? Siddharth, okay. Anyone else would like to read? Prince, okay, Arin. Okay, so since uh, four of you have, yeah, no worries, Kiran. Uh, so each of you can read um, three verses each, uh, and two of you can read four, four verses each. Okay, so we'll begin with Titus chapter 2. Uh, Dave, would you like to read the first uh, four verses? Sure. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that, that the aged man be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged woman likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not giving given too much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. Thank you. Uh, so, Arun, can you read 5, 6, and 7, please? To be, to be self-controlled and pure, and to be good housewives, who submit to their husbands, so that no one will speak evil of the message that comes from God. In the same way, urge the young men to be self-controlled in all things you yourself must be an example of good behavior. Be sincere and serious in all in your teaching. Use sound words that cannot be criticized so that your enemies, enemies may be put to shame by not having anything bad to say about us. Thank Slave you. art. Yeah, did you read verse 7 till verse 7? Yeah, uh, till verse 8. Oh, till verse 8. Okay. Okay, so um, uh, Prince, would you like to read 9, 10, and 11, please? John. Exhort one servant to be obedient to their own master, to be well pleasing in, the, in all things, not answering back not preferring but showing all good fidelity that they may they may adorn the doctrine of god our savior in all things for the grace of god that brings salvation has appeared to all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust we should live Severally, righteously and good, godly in the present age. Thank you. Uh, verses 13 to 15, Siddharth. While we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself, for himself a people that are his own, eager to do what is good. These then are the things you should teach, encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. Okay. Thank you all for reading. So in chapter two, anything that uh, caught your attention, anything that you felt came alive to you, anything that uh, struck you or something that brought back, uh, something that you had read sometime back, or maybe even God spoke to you something this morning, even as you were reading this. Would you like to share? It'd be nice if all of us can share one or two thoughts about what you picked up or what you learned 
or what caught your eye in Titus chapter 2? Like to share, please, someone, or you can type it in the chat section, whatever you think you've learned. Just one or two things, or just a verse you like to read. Yeah, but so uh, eleven as uh, but uh. The God's grace for everyone that is uh, been a salvation. So uh, when we receive His grace, our life uh, should uh, righteously and godly in this also. Thank you, Prince. So he says that we have received salvation because of the grace of God, and as a result, we need to live holy and righteous, uh, bright lives. Thank you. Aaron says, verse 4, uh, we must be an example. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, in chapter 2, who do you think uh, Paul is talking about here? Okay, Dave says, verse 8, must control what we speak and no evil should come out, rather exhorting others. Thank you. Uh, in chapter 2, who is, uh, what is basically Paul uh, telling Titus? Or what is he writing to Titus about? This will be easy because it's there in your Bible. You can just see and... So what is he writing to Titus about in chapter 2? Character of someone who is in ministry, okay? Thank you. Anyone else? He's giving instructions about what? Or on whom is he giving instructions? He's basically instructing how older men, older women, Younger men, younger women in the church, and even slaves who are part of the church, how they should live their lives. And also he goes on not just to talk about older men, older women, younger men, uh, younger women, and also instructions for born servants in the church, but also how Titus, as a young person, how he should uh, conduct his life uh, as a leader. Okay. Uh, did Paul talk about this in uh, Timothy as to Timothy as well, or to he write about this to the church at Timothy uh, at Ephesus? Yes. No. Yes. Thank you. Yes, he did. Okay. So. Uh, he's also writing here to the church at Crete because there is a need. So we look at what are the instructions he gives for older men and women in the church. Then we look for at the instructions he gives for younger men and younger women and also for born servants or slaves. So this is not something that is uh, going to be irrelevant for us. It's, it's very relevant because some of you are older men. Uh, we don't have older women here, but, uh, you know, uh, 
some of you and most of you are younger men and younger women so we can receive from what uh, paul is trying to um, uh, uh, he's right he has written to the church at uh, crete or he has written to uh, titus okay in verse one he says but as for you speak the things which are uh, are proper for sound doctrine so he says but as for you uh, is a contrast uh, uh, contrast titus with the false teachers that paul has just described in uh, chapter 1 verses 10 to 16 where he says that these men are rebellious empty talkers and deceivers uh, who kind of upset whole families for the sake of uh, gain dirty gain uh, he also says that uh, they are teaching Jewish myths, uh, which are the commandments of men rather than the truth in God's word, which he talks about in verse 14. And he says such uh, unbiblical teaching does not lead to godliness and to good deeds. So in contrast to all of these things that he has spoken, uh, Paul is telling Titus to speak the things that are proper for sound doctrine. Thus, uh, Paul used this word sound doctrine uh, before. Yes, no. Has he used this word sound doctrine before? I think so. Yes, he's used this couple of times, this word sound doctrine. He uses even when he's writing uh, to uh, Timothy. Um, and, uh, you know, he says the things, okay, speak the things. The things Paul has mentioned in verses 2 right up to verse 10. He says, speak those things, uh, those things that are pertaining to truth, attitudes and actions that are based on biblical truths he's telling titus to uh, speak those things and he says uh, which are proper for sound doctrine now just for us to understand this phrase uh, proper for sound doctrine i've uh, put in some different translations what it says the living bible says a uh, speak up for the right living that goes along with true christianity the new living translation says promote the kind of living that reflects right teaching and the passion translation says your duty is to teach them to embrace a lifestyle that is consistent with sound doctrine so why I've put these translations here is the idea behind this phrase um, is not just about right living. Uh, it, it's not just about, sorry, right thinking, but it has to do with right living. Okay, so sound doctrine, uh, uh, we read in Titus chapter 1 verse 9, where he writes there about sound, uh, sound doctrine. It's more focused on teaching sound doctrine to refute those who are false teachers who are bringing about false teachings and errors against the truth but the focus here in chapter 2 verse 1 the same word sec, uh, sound doctrine is more a practical application of the sound uh, doctrine so we see that Paul uh, you know always ties together sound doctrine with practical Christian living that flows out of the teaching that we receive. So sound doctrine is yes teaching which he mentions about in verse uh, chapter 1 verse 9 but here when he's talking about sound doctrine it more has to do with not just about teaching but what you have been taught is to uh, you know you need to apply that it's more practical uh, application practical christian living as a as a which flows out as a result of uh, the sound doctrine that you have received or that you have been taught or that you have um, learned okay um, so in verse 2, he says that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience. So he's talking about how older men should be. Um, and he says, uh, you know, he, Paul wants Titus to know that older men must live with maturity and wisdom, uh, which means that they need to live sober, reverent, and temperate lives. Uh, and it's the command to and he says, you know, com uh, he's commanding Titus to 
teach these things because these things don't come uh, or come automatically even though these are older men they are much mature in age or they are much older not sorry mature but they are much older in age uh, all of these things things does not come automatically but it they have to be taught these things so if you are older and these qualities do not describe you then you need to focus on them uh, rather than going on as you are so what are the qualities that older men should have the first thing is sober what is the meaning of sober we uh, talked about this in um, first and second timothy being sober reverent temperate what is the meaning of sober anyone Sober means to be vigilant. That means to be watchful. Uh, older men should be watchful over themselves, watch over their conduct, their conversation, what they are saying, in case they act evil or they speak things that that are evil or live uh, evil lives. Uh, then there would be a wrong example to the younger people in the church. He says that they need to be also be reverent. That means they should uh, uh, live honorable lives in the way they behave, in their speech, in their dressing. Uh, they should be temperate. Okay. Uh, the word literally means here uh, not to be intoxicated by wine or strong drink, uh, but it also means to be sober minded and clear headed. Okay, and they have to be sound in faith. That means sound means be healthy in their faith. Um, uh, so the older men should be healthy in their faith in God, uh, which comes uh, from trusting God in practical matters of life, uh, which they have lived or experienced over the years. Um, they should be sound in their minds in the doctrine of faith, um, so that they don't lead other younger people into uh, you know uh, error or in the way of uh, in, in the wrong way uh, but their faith in christ should appear to be right and genuine and he says uh, in love uh, you know as older people grow uh, grow old uh, they become you know very grouchy they become very hard to live with uh, they're kind of complaining over everything murmuring grumbling uh, you know and paul says they should not be like that but they should be more loving uh, they should be more intolerant uh, they should uh, uh, you know they should be more tolerant to people rather than being more intolerant and hardened towards others they should be more gracious and uh, compassionate Okay, and then the last thing he says is, you know, they should um, uh, be sound in faith, in love, and in patience. Okay, patience means uh, being steadfast uh, and act. Uh, uh, endurance uh, not like a passive waiting uh, you know once you come to uh, an old age uh, you know people we see that older people just sit down do nothing just waiting for that uh, to die um, uh, you know just patiently waiting to die and to uh, spend life in uh, eternity um, but here he says you know they need to be active um, actively endure things that come the challenges of life they have the difficulties uh, that they face challenges of the old age that they face uh, and they should continue running their race with endurance fixing their eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of their faith like we read in Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 and uh, so he says when older men who have these qualities you know when they have all of these qualities they will stand out in the world and they will uh, reflect Christ's likeness or they will reflect the beauty of Christ okay verse 3 then he comes talking about uh, older women how should older women be here what does he say how, sh how does he say that older women should be given in verse 3 you can how should older women be what does Paul say in verse 3 what are the characteristics they should have
They should live a holy life, yes, uh, not given to much wine. Teaching good things, yes. Thank you, Erin and Dave, for not being slanderers. Okay, so older women, uh, he's talking about those who no longer have uh, child rearing responsibilities, the children are all grown, settled. Uh, so they must be typically around 60 years of age. And he says uh, the older women should have these qualities, they should be reverent. Uh, so the Greek word uh, here, reverent, is used only here in the Bible. Um, and it conveys an idea of, a, of being priest-like. Okay, That means acting as a representative of God. Um, and so this is a word that Paul uses to describe a devout, godly character of an older woman. There should be someone who is priest-like, somebody who is acting like a representative of God, means of presenting God himself in the way that they live, the way they act, the way they speak. So the older women have to live holy lives, uh, live like holy priests, serving in the presence of God. And their personal devotion to God or to the Lord uh, will influence, uh, you know, others and also influence every aspect of their personal life. So they have to give themselves wholly to serving God uh, in the and be in the presence of God. Uh, and their behavior is basically talking about their inner character. Okay, they should not be slanderers. It's very interesting here that this word slanderer. What is the meaning of slanderer? Anyone? What's the meaning of slanderer? No idea, slanderers? Basically those who talk ill or bad or evil about others. Uh, it's very interesting to read that, you know, the Greek word here for, uh, for slanderers is diabolos. Does this word, Greek word diabolos, uh, bring back any idea about who diabolos is? Or who is referred to as diabolos? Who else is, who is called diabolos? The Greek word. Satan. Okay, Satan, uh, the other name for Satan is Diabolos, the Greek word. And this name of Satan is used 34 times in the New Testament. And we know Satan is uh, called as the false accuser. Uh, so each time, you know, a believer, uh, uh, you know, uh, talks or accuses or talks evil or bad about somebody else, they're doing the work of Satan. Okay, so when older women or any um, uh, anyone else slanders and gossips about somebody else, you know, talking bad about somebody else, gossiping about them behind their back, they're doing the devil's work. Uh, so he says, godly women are never to surrender their tongues to the devil. So it's not only just godly women, but it's all of us. We need to remember that anytime we're talking ill or evil. Uh, or uh, bad about somebody behind their back, we're actually doing the work of Satan. It's we are, slanderers here is Diabolos, uh, the name of Satan, who is falsely accusing people. So we need to watch our tongue and we need to also sur surrender our tongues to God daily so that we can talk things that are pleasing and holy and acceptable in his sight. Okay, we'll stop here, we'll take a break and we'll come back after the break. Thank you.